Season 4 of Notebook on Cities and Culture is brought to you by Daniel Murphy, Polar Inertia, a journal of nomadic and popular culture online at polarinertia.com, and by PressUp, friendly web consultants who listen to your goals and provide solutions that make sense. Online at pressupinc.com. Out of curiosity, what do you think the difference is in the London experience for the monocle reader and somebody who's never touched an issue? I guess the people who pick up monocle are not looking for you know, the, the shiny, the new always. So the monocle reader is often somebody who wanders around a city and is very happy to go to the cafe that's been there 50 years. They want to kind of uh, see the city's many layers. They're not just here to go to the latest restaurant, the latest club, the latest bar. I'm sure they'll be tempted along the way. So their view of the city is often about older things, things that have been worn in by time. Mm. And I think that there are often people who probably shy away from some of the kind of uh, busier, more central hubs to try and find the things that make London unique. So I think that lots of people who read Monocle, they're lucky they travel around the world, they see lots of different places. And they're a bit bored of uh, getting out of a plane or getting off a train and seeing an urban landscape or a hotel room or a restaurant that kind of looks like it could be in any city. Ah. So that sense of place and the things that make each city special or unique tend to be the things that would hook in a monocle reader. Mm. I'm sitting here in London specifically in Marlebone, with Andrew Tuck, the founding editor of Monocle magazine, as well as the editor of the new Monocle book, The Monocle Guide to Better Living. Monocle now has been one of the most successful magazines for the past decade. It's about, you know, to me, what isn't it about? Aesthetics, cities, world affairs, business, design, it's, it's all in there. And when I first picked up an issue in 2007 of Monocle, I found, I found it cool on the surface, yes, but it was one of the few magazines I found directly engaging with cities per se with through the world with engaging with the world through cities through that framework was that a, was that on the plan from day one this city's framework to it we've always been an urban magazine so i think the dream of most of our readers is to have a, a city home to live in a neighborhood that works a neighborhood that thrives that they think of you know contemporary luxury as not having a chauffeur sitting outside your front door but being able to walk to work, be on a bicycle, to be able to get around your city very simply. Mm. But we noticed that from, there were lots of surveys about what made a great city, but most of them ignored the things that would make a great city for, for people like us, the, the, right. like for me and for Tyler and for our friends and for people we felt would be the audience of Monocle. So yes, you could pick up a survey that would tell you about healthcare or you know, what the education system was like if you were an expat. But there were smaller things that we felt that made a city tick. You know, for example, you know, when you went to your high street, were you going to be surprised at the stores you found there? Would there be a good hardware store? Would there be a good neighborhood store? So we began a, a quality of life survey, and one of the very first questions we asked were, you know, how many branches of Starbucks are there in your city? And it wasn't that we were particularly opposed to Starbucks, but it was a good indicator of the number of chains, so then we, then we started counting the number of Zaras in a city. Yeah. And it gave an indication of whether a city was, uh, was robust, whether it was uh, good for young entrepreneurs, whether you could start up a cafe and a shop and get a place on the high street. So that was really important to us. And then we began to look at other things that made a city tick. You know, we still believe that people should go to the cinema, so we count cinema mm -hmm. screens. We think that cities should have a 24-hour metabolism. So, you know, what time do things close? Can you get a glass of wine that isn't in a kind of crazy nightclub at one o'clock in the morning? Mm. You come home from a trip, it's a Sunday. You know, can you go and buy groceries? You know, where do those groceries come from? You want to build a house. You know, is the city going to be amenable to you putting up something that's interesting? So we've, over the years, developed this city survey, which began the first summer we launched, and we've d done it every summer since then. We add more metrics every year. And that started a conversation with both our readers, but also with civic leaders. So literally from the very first time we did that survey, you know, we had people calling saying, OK, we'd like to be on your survey next year. How can we do that? Well, bad luck, we choose who's on the survey. But often they were saying... You know, you, you're telling us about the experience of you know, Zurich and what they're doing. 
which may not be the most exciting city, but they're ticking lots of boxes. Tell us why it's interesting. How can we engage in this conversation? And I think more and more the conversation around cities is so dominated by one or two topics. The monocle has had a bit of an, uh, kind of, um, an open field in a way. Yeah. We're talking about very different topics than you normally find discussed at urbanist conferences. We're talking about the small scale, the human scale, the tangible, you know, the things you touch, the, the pace of a city, the scale of a city. And those things that you touched on earlier on, aesthetics, often don't come up in the urbanist conferences and the urbanist debate. They're ignored. And I think that we've become a bit of a talking shop for them. Mm. And not just about cities. I mean, I think one of the reasons I latched on to Monocle is that, correct me if I'm wrong, but aesthetics are near paramount in all topics in Monocle. They're, or it's not near paramount, but they're there. They're always there. Aesthetics is always a topic, no matter what you're discussing in Monocle. You don't ignore that, do you? Not at all. You, you uh, we, we feel that aesthetics you know, are important to everything. But again, it's important for us that it's not mistaken for having money or it's not about cash. You know, that when you look at the, the residences, for example, that are shot for the magazine, mm. often they're very humble, simple places. You know, we'll shoot wow. a house in Greece where, in fact, you look around the inside and there's probably half a dozen pieces of furniture, but it has something about it that makes it feel like a home. Mm. We've done a house in Japan which literally had a single light that you pulled around on a wire, depending what room you were in. That simplicity to us seems important. And I think that, that the aesthetics are, are again, you know, can you create something that feels permanent? So again, when we inspire people to hopefully think about making a home or building a home or commissioning an architect, we're not in that world of you know, the, the property agent saying, build this, it will be worth X amount of money, you can sell it really quickly and do something else. We're trying to encourage people, whether that's you know, building a business, building a home, even buying a jacket for their wardrobe, yes. to think about things that are not so ephemeral, that are built to last, that are robust, because then you get a very quiet, sustainable message. You know, the, the jacket that you buy, that you wear for five years, that's good. That's, you know, that's something that goes a journey with you, that you love a bit more because its elbows begin to wear out. How can we make that relevant for homes as well? So again, the homes, the cities, the places we talk about, we don't want them all to be squeaky clean. Right. So I can give you an, another example. On the scale side, when you look at a city, we've often talked about how amazing a city Beirut is. Now, Beirut right. is kind of dysfunctional in some senses and hyper-functional in other senses. So it lacks, for example, a good, uh, a, a good public transport system. It kind of fails in its ability to kind of provide services when you need them. If you want to be hooked up to electricity, it may take weeks for somebody to come and do it. But it has a bit of grit. It has a bit of excitement. It has amazing people who've been through lots of trials and tribulations and have come out the other side as entrepreneurs, as people who know how to fix things. It still makes stuff in the city. You can turn down any street. You can go to like Marmakel, the, the, one of the, the big uh, neighborhoods in the heart of the city, and you will hear the clatter of machinery and people printing things and making things and hammering metal. Now, that seems to us an important thing and we look at that city often not just to say look here's somewhere exotic and extraordinary right. but we also say look at this place because a london can learn from that right you don't want city streets in the center of london to be dead during the day you know shuttered with uh, wealthy owners living abroad most of the time you want to turn down a city street here in london as well and still see that you can get your car repaired at the corner that there's a pub where people spill out of on a summer's night. Mm. So that debate about noise in the city, a good thing. Uh, the clatter of making things, a good thing. Uh, craft, a thing we, which we believe in throughout the magazine. So it all ties in, whether we're talking about urbanism or we're talking about your jacket, we think there are lots of common threads. You've got it something about the definition of aesthetics Monocle uses that so appeals. It is, it's aesthetics as a kind of timeless vitality, not as lavishness, right? It's certainly not about lavishness. So again, you know, some guiding principles for the magazine that, you know, you'll never see a fashion shoot with somebody climbing out of a private jet. You won't see million pound jewelry dripping off the women. It's a stripped back aesthetic. I think that lots of people who are reading Monocle are probably 
late 20s, 30s, but right the way through to their 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. And they're thinking about things that were lost. You, you, we're in a room here when we look around the, the table in front of us. I know who made this. Mm -hmm. It's made from English oak. It's made by a young company here in Britain. They want to make stuff that lasts forever. This table, there's no reason why this table can't be here in 60 years' time. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we're encouraging people. So this idea of slow food, we all, we all understand. But there's a slowness about the aesthetics we're trying to explain to people and a slowness about cities and a slowness about everything we touch that we think is important. So as a brand, as a company, for example, we don't do an iPad version. Maybe one day there'll be a need for it. But at the moment, we want people to read the magazine on paper. We want them to you know, feel the weight of paper that we chose because we feel that's the best way to see the stories. We've done everything slowly. We don't think you have to be the first person or the loudest person or the noisiest person. There's lots of things that you can do quietly and simply, and that slowness runs through everything we do. Behind it all, there's the sense that whatever what your table is made of, what your jacket is made of, what your magazine is made of, physical materials affecting the way you do things, the way you live, the way you think, correct? Yes, and again, it kind of touches back on something quite important. I think that... Part of our DNA is the fact that we launched in 2007. So who knew, but you know, nine months later, the world's economy collapsed. Mm -hmm. Now, that could have been a terrible year for a startup magazine, but turned out to be one of the best years for us because we were talking about stuff that people really understood. We were talking about tangible things, things you could make with your hands, we were arguing from the beginning that you know that cities couldn't be run just on financial services. You know that there was a generation of people who should be making things. That, right. You know they should be learning skills. They should be getting apprenticeships. So again, those are all things that we've argued about from the very beginning, and that's where that lavishness doesn't come in. It's it's a, it's a practical, honest way of thinking about how we run cities. So we've done a great story on Austria where they have. Uh, a very high number of people that go into apprenticeships, something like 30, 40% of young people go into an apprenticeship. They don't go off to university mm -hmm. because there's a high value put on making stuff. And that's not about making lavish things. That's about you know being a plumber, being a cake maker, being a shoemaker. But once you've done those skills, people think they're really valuable. And again, that's another part of the kind of DNA of Monocle. So we came out in 2008 fighting and we talked about these really simple things. And we encouraged people to go back to their roots and to think about stuff that mattered to them. And I think that's just as relevant. Anyway, we know it's just as relevant today because we sell more magazines every year. And people come to us because there's a timelessness, there's, a, there's an honesty about the aesthetic we're talking about. It's a provocative message to send from the financial center of Europe, is it not? It's kind of provocative. But here's the strange thing. It's, you know, when you come to one of our parties or one of our events, we do tons of events. Uh, we did 60 events last year for subscribers. You get in a conversation with somebody who's you know, the head of Deutsche Bank, who is uh, a senior person in a law firm who's leading you know, uh, a, a trading company. You ask them what they want to do or why they read Monocle. They dream of kind of having a baker's, they, they want to start a bookstore. Something small scale. Small scale, where they see the influence of what they do every day. Mm -hmm. And we see that. We see every year we do a, a, an issue about entrepreneurship. And we get the letters year in, year out saying, I read your entrepreneur's guide last year. Just let you know, I left my business. I now do this. Mm -hmm. So often people are leaving jobs f to be paid less money, but they feel kind of disconnected. And again, that's one of the things, you know, you know, we have business pages, but you don't see any discussion about, you know, share prices. Mm -hmm. All of our business pages are encouraging people to think, actually, you could run a business. Mm -hmm. And I think you know, that everyone will say that everyone's got a book in them. And I always say, I think every monocle reader has a business in them. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean starting up some big enterprise, but something they believe they could do with passion that probably involves them rolling up their sleeves. That's who the monocle reader is. They're, they're, they're kind of a doer. They're somebody who wants to get involved in the community. Now, I've read that you came to London first at 18. Was that the start of your interest personally in cities? Um, 
So I grew up, I guess, about 30 miles from London. And coming to London, you know, as a kid when I was like five, six, seven, eight, nine, my parents bring here kind of once every six, seven months to go to the museums and to see the city. Was that a, a well looked forward to outing yeah, every time? It was a place of dreams. Ah. It was a place of excitement. You, you arrived in London, whether it was to see the Christmas lights or it was to go to the Natural History Museum. It was a city that inspired you. You, you wanted to come back. You know, London stood for excitement. Mm. And I've had an amazing relationship with the city. I, you know, I, I've lived here many, many years. I haven't uh, ever, li I've li traveled the world many times, but I've never had my roots anywhere else. Mm. And I find a city which you grow into like that extraordinary. You know, I can't, there's probably very few streets in central London that I can walk down where I haven't once had a drink with somebody, I haven't once spoken to somebody, or something happened to me. A personal history is embedded in this city for you. Yeah, and uh, and also, you, you, you know, my, my dad used to come to work in the city, my dad's not alive anymore, and he used to tell me stories about working in Holborn, which is an area I now live in. And I can't but walk through that neighborhood without every now and then imagining him you know, as a young man getting off the tram. A tram did exist then, it got, it got ripped out, but I know that he came to work by tram. And the strange thing is the tunnel where the tram used to pop out still exists. There's this kind of barricaded tram tunnel that sits uh, just near Holborn Tube Station. Oh, is that what that thing is? Yeah. <laughs> and, and he would have, he, he you, you used to come all the way up the Kingsway mm. uh, and you'd pop out the other end. And that was his stop. That's where he got off at work in the morning. Mm. So when, you're, when your life is so caught up in a city, when, you know, it's bricks and mortar tell your personal history as well it's a very hard place to leave it means so much to you mm. but i think the extraordinary thing about london is like any great city its ability to surprise you so even now you know, you you turn down a street and you see something you haven't seen what's something you've spotted recently that you didn't expect to see I don't know about saying you haven't seen but literally this morning so we've had days and days of rain so I try to, if I walk, I walk this morning, it's a 40 minute walk from my home, and I try and take a different route every day. And I can't help but be impressed by it. So I cut through Russell Square, there's a, on a, what would have been a bomb site in the 50s, they built a higher education a training center, which is a brutalist building, but in the winter light, looked amazing. I cut through the university district, which oddly, most Londoners seem to think is private and off, off bounds, but it's not. And, oh. you, and you walked through and I was caught up by the buzz of people being students. Uh, I walked past Senate House, a place where I'd gone and studied when I was a student as well. Mm. You know, I love the fact that London reminds you of so many things. It's hard to walk through the city without being caught up with something, without imagining what happened. There's this personal history that roots you here and makes it a place for you to base yourself. But as well, do you think that the the internationalism of London makes it more suitable because you travel so much, because you have to keep an international perspective. Does this, the internationalism within London afford you something in that way as well? Uh, not just me, but as Monocle, I think the amazing thing is that when, if we open the door here and walked out, we have on this floor, well, we have sitting with us, David, who's Canadian. If you walked out on the floor, we have on this floor, we have Koreans, we have uh, Japanese, we have uh, Hong Kong uh, Chinese, uh, we have uh, Colombians, we have Spaniards, we have Bulgarians. Now, when we were creating Monocle, we didn't want to create an English magazine or a British magazine. We kind of wanted to create something that we knew would be rooted here. So it's, it's a European sensibility, I guess. Mm -hmm. But it needed to feel relevant and global and so it has to, every story has to pass that test you know, if you're sitting on the beach in singer in um, sydney or you're kind of going to work in san francisco and you pick up the magazine and you read even the small story does it tell you something you didn't know does it kind of uh, inspire you in some way is it fresh information and the way that that happens is because all these people on this floor they know the world and they bring something to the magazine that's not just a british sensibility mm. So I often read the magazine and see stuff, you know, that surprises me. You know, that people have a perspective on the world that isn't rooted from being like me in London. They they have their own personal histories, whether that was, you know, in uh, Tokyo or Sofia, mm. that adds something to the page. Mm. Now, with this show in the past couple of years, I've gone to not just 
England, but to Copenhagen and Japan and Mexico City and Vancouver and San Francisco, Portland, of course, Los Angeles, all, all around there. You've written a lot about the importance of actually going places. Tell me, tell me what you believe about that, about, about not just an international perspective, but of getting your feet on the ground somewhere else. Well, it's fascinating. There's a, you know, we hear, to, you know, especially after there was the economic crash, people were encouraged to believe that they didn't have to travel, that they could do everything by Skype and video conferencing. You could do stuff by email. There was no longer a reason to meet people. And it's nonsense. You know, we can't we can't do on the business side, the commercial side, the relations we have with people are deep and they're deep because yeah, you go and meet them to talk about business, but then you go for a drink, you know about their families, you meet them time and time again. Mm. You know, a good example is the work we have a lot of commercial partners in Japan. Well, actually two days after the tsunami, as as the, the nuclear meltdown was happening, uh our, public, our, our chairman had a, a scheduled flight to go there for business talks. And he was like, I'm going. There's no reason for me not to go. These people are showing commitment to us. We'll show commitment back. Right. And those, so the relationships we have with people are deep. And I think also what's amazing is, we're, you know, for example, on the urbanist side, we're often read by city mayors and people running uh, city uh, transport networks. Now, how do you know what's good and how do you know what works and how do you know what's inspiring and how do you know what really engages people if you're only reading about it in journals and you, know, you need to go and see it for yourself. And I think, you know, if you're trying to benchmark something as the best, then you need to go and see other people. You, you know, it's great. We met Amanda Burden, who worked in New York under Mayor Bloomberg. Well, She'd been to Copenhagen. She'd gone to see Jan Gale's work. She hadn't just read about it. Jan Gale was on the show, by the way, so good company. Uh, good company. And again, David, who's here with me, went to meet him as well. So we, you know, an inspiring man. But again, you have to go and see if it works. You know, Jan Gale is a great example. So everybody's talking about Jan Gale and everybody wants their city to be like Copenhagen. The reality is that that can't happen, shouldn't happen, won't happen. But it's good to go and see his work in action and decide which bits of it are relevant for your city or which bits work for you. And you can't do that just by looking at aerial photos or seeing a film. You need to go and judge yourself. Mm. Now, I should mention as well, you're the host of The Urbanist, a show on Monocle's 24, their, their online radio station, a show where you've actually interviewed me about Los Angeles of the tables and are turned. How did that Urbanist project begin? Was this something you wanted to do? Was this something that Monocle wanted to produce a show about specifically urbanism? Yeah, it, it, it came out of the, the quality of life survey, which I talked about, we did in the magazine, the, the fact that the magazine is so rooted in urbanism. And you know, you're an exception, but the fact is that radio stations don't have shows about urbanism. Mm -hmm. It's a thing that touches every single person every single day and doesn't get talked about. Or if it does get talked about, it gets hijacked often by urbanists. Now, we all love an urbanist, but often the conversation amongst urbanists is deliberately wrapped in a kind of a pseudo-scientific language. Uh, the people who work in City Hall can't even talk in plain English about it. Um, and we felt that, you know, that here was a chance to do something that was uh, intelligent, knowledgeable, spoke to the best people in the field, but didn't let them get away with you know, urbanist speak, which challenged them when they needed to be challenged, but also made a program that the average listener would stumble across on the dial and be engaged with because you know, it was talking about stuff that was important to their city. So, yes, we talk about, you know, sometimes very gritty issues or, or slightly highbrow issues to do with density or to do with traffic flow. Mm -hmm. But we've talked about animals in the city. We've talked about speed in the city. So we've talked about, you know, the slow city. How, you know, how do you slow people down? What's the significance of a park bench? You know, should people have places to rest? Mm -hmm. you know, all of these elements... We've, we've discussed, and the reaction has been amazing. We've, we've, we've been on a real journey with that show over the last two years, me and David Michel, my producer. We've been around the world. We've been invited to talk to conferences. And again, I think what's great is that, you know, our, our view isn't a complicated view. Our view is a very simple view, perhaps a little bit old-fashioned in places. But you turn up to all of these conferences and everybody is saying the same thing because they're dominated by the tech companies as sponsors. So the, the conversation is about 
the smart city, the wired city, the future of the, the, you know, the urbanist app, you know, great. But that's only part of the conversation. And it's very hard because it's hard to commercialize to get people to talk about how big should be the trees that you plant on a city street be? Should, you know, is it really worth planting small trees? Why don't you plant big trees? You know, what's, the, what's the optimum height that really residents sh should be? What's the significance of a corner store to turning around a neighborhood? What's the role of the entrepreneur? All these things, then they don't have a kind of price tag on them. They're very, not hard, they're sometimes hard for sponsors to get their heads around because they're not rooted in, you know, Silicon Valley. They're not, uh, they're not coming out of Palo Alto, mm. but that isn't where the conversation should sit. And the other thing is that there's a terrible, terrible tendency to think that all cities are kind of the same. Uh. So yeah, we know that, you know, if one more person tells you that, you know, you know, the majority of people now live in, now live in cities, there's millions of people, you know, moving to Bangalore every year, fine. But that's not happening in, in Madrid, and that's not happening in Zurich. That's actually not happening in Detroit. Mm -hmm. So each of these cities needs to have their own conversation. And the trouble is that we're only getting focused on this kind of rush to the cities, which is an important, important conversation. But it's, it's a dialogue. It's, it's not it's a dialogue. It's a, it's, it's a confusion of voices out there, as it should be, because every city has slightly different needs, slightly different ambitions. And it's not good to lump everywhere together. And I think that's what Monocle's good at. Monocle's good at saying, Do you know what? We've got a, co a correspondent who lives in Caracas. Mm -hmm. We've got a correspondent that lives in Bangkok. We know somebody in Yangon. And we will talk to them about their specific challenges. It's not a kind of a, a one model fits every single city. As you say, cities will not turn themselves into Copenhagen, no matter how hard they try, no matter how much they admire Copenhagen, for example. But what is it about a Copenhagen, a Melbourne, a Zurich that places them so high when Monocle looks at these things? So the, the Monocle Quality of Life Survey should not be confused for the Monocle Fun Survey or the Monocle kind of Big Night Out Survey. <laughs> we recognize that some of those things, when we try to build them in yeah. to the survey, are more complicated to add in metrics. So we go out and look at cities that work. You know, so actually, what's the percentage of people that go to work on a bicycle commute by bicycle it seems like 100 in copenhagen but yeah it's 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 50 plus percent in a, uh, in a copenhagen or an amsterdam or a you know a groningen but that can't be transported everywhere so we say yes this is a this is a good model this is a good model to learn from but we know the scale of cities mm -hmm. you know that actually that's of course a tougher ask in London, mm -hmm. but then you have to kind of look at things like you know crime. So you know crime in London compared to say crime in Tokyo. Well, why is it that Tokyo is so cohesive in comparison to a London? Mm -hmm. So it's we begin to rank these cities, but a Copenhagen or Zurich do well because you know both reasonably wealthy cities. A Copenhagen benefits from the the Nordic world's uh, belief in kind of. A, s a slightly flat society, mm -hmm. so you don't have so many kind of uh, bumps, bumps of wealth and uh, and uh, lack of wealth. There's a kind of feeling that you know the environment is incredibly important when you come from the Nordic nation. So it's quite easy to people get people on board to do stuff which you know, is recycling, which is saving energy. But these places aren't all perfect. We're just saying that if you if you boil it down to metrics. These are the cities that will do well. And we always add as an antidote in that same issue, five cities which will never win on metrics. The wild cards? Yeah, the wild cards. Yes. But hey, they're cities which there's that element of grit with a Beirut. So, you know, why is it that someone from Naples wouldn't want to live anywhere else? Mm. You know, what is it about that city that really makes it, you know, an exciting place to live? And and so every every year we always pick these other cities to kind of balance it out a bit. Say, urban planners can do their best. Mm -hmm. You can build the perfect city, but at the end of the day, there is something which is not caught in metrics, which is hard to explain, mm -hmm. which is probably best described as magic, <laughs> which actually makes you love certain cities. You know, Buenos Aires broke, yeah. but. My God, people who know it and love it wouldn't live anywhere else. Rio, yeah, sunny, incredible, incredible landscape, brilliant beaches, good drinks. But 
intense poverty, mm-hmm. huge numbers of people living in informal settlements. But even they wouldn't want to live anywhere else. There's something about Rio that is just magic. There's, there's, mm-hmm. there's something you can't always have a tick next to to explain. The intangible. Yeah. Mm. You mentioned Tokyo. What, what is it about Japan? Why is Japan so important to Monocle? I mean, I was there last year with this show. I can see why I love it, but why does Monocle love it? Or you, indeed. Why do you, if, if you go there often? Okay, so when we started this magazine, we felt that there was a really peculiar thing, which is, you know, at the time, uh, Japan was actually, uh, I think, the second biggest economy in the world. I think it's third now. But where was the coverage of Japan in other magazines and newspapers? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you'd see the odd story about a rear can. You'd see some stories about how crazy Japanese people were on television. You'd see maybe a little bit of coverage of one of the two of the big corporations in the business pages. But 90% of Japan went unreported. Mm-hmm. Now, we felt, first of all, that was an omission. There were lots of interesting stories to be told there. The second thing is, Japan is a culture and a society that's still very good at service. Mm -hmm. You get on a Japanese airline, you fly ANA or JAL, the minute you're on that plane, you're in a different world. Now, why is that? And, you know, when you compare that to, say, an American airline, why is there such a gulf in the kind of level of service you would get? And that goes for everything from restaurants to hotels to bars to shops. What is it about that level of service? Where does that come from? A cohesive society. Mm-hmm. Interesting to know why. You know, is that because it's not very mixed? Is that because uh, of a conservatism? Mm-hmm. But it does mean that when you're in Tokyo and you get lost, you never think, I might be attacked or mugged or I've w- wandered into the wrong neighborhood. Oh, nice. That would never happen to you. I've been in Japan numerous times and got lost numerous times yes. maybe yeah, we all have maybe three or four times somebody has literally spotted that i'm lost they've taken me down onto the subway put me on the right train mm-hmm. they've spoken to the taxi driver they've gone out of their way to help you what is it about japan so there were, there were lessons we th- thought were important mm-hmm. interesting that they continue to believe in making stuff which is again mm-hmm. as i said a very important part of monocle so you know, whether that's you know making porcelain or making food, that idea of doing stuff with your hands is is really important. Because Tokyo and many of the cities were destroyed during the war, they've had a kind of an endless ability to rebuild and knock down and rebuild. This actually made it have some of the most exciting architecture around. Mm. They are very good at urbanism. You go to somewhere like Rapongi Hills or you go to any any project done by one of the, the kind of the big players in Tokyo. Once it's open, you won't be able to tell the join between what we used to be there and what's new. Right. That thing I talked to you about trees, they don't put in tiny trees, they put in you know, 50, 60 year old trees. They landscape well, they make it fit into the community, they build the subway underneath the building before it started. That sense of forward planning seems really, really uh, interesting to us. And I think we just felt there's a lot of things that we could all learn from. And you know, the same with the Nordic country, the same with the Switzerland. You know, of course, these are economies that are doing well. But when you're benchmarking success in lots of things, then you need to be looking at Japan. Mm-hmm. You mentioned the question that comes up when anybody goes to Japan, I think, is well, why does this work so well? Why does the flight I took in work so well? well why, why do these vending machines out on the street work so well? Cities always, they, they bring up questions like that. You, in American cities, I'll often wonder why something doesn't work, for example, but it, it can get more complicated than that. Tell me, what cities have been putting a lot of questions in your head lately when you experience them, or even indeed just think about them, the cities that just generate for you many questions right now? Um, well, obviously, uh, Tokyo is a, a very good example. I think the speed at which New York has changed is mm-hmm. extraordinary. You know, whether you're a fan or a critic of the Bloomberg years, and again, uh, we did a two-part series on the Bloomberg years uh, on The Urbanist, uh, produced by and, and presented by David. That is an extraordinary example of a city, a huge city, you know, changing in 
in kind of a fundamental way. And I know lots of people are antagonistic or find that it's kind of become a little bit kind of sugary in places and it's it's not the New York that they pretend they loved in the 70s when <laughs> you, you might have someone shooting up heroin next to you on the subway. But you can cycle around the city now. You know, the, the way that that city has treated outdoor space, for example, is a remarkable revolution that, you know, the, the zoning law, how zoning laws have been used to help people have, you know, street side cafes or to change the, the, the format of shops. I think that you realize that if you have the right people, whatever political persuasion, and I'm, I'm not saying that Bloomberg is the only person that could have done it, and it isn't, I don't think, down to his wealth. I think it's down to determination that you can really turn around a city. Mm. I think the High Line has probably had a bit kind of too much press from everyone, mm. but it is a good example, again, of an urban project. Probably it's, it's probably the, the cherry on the, the urbanist cape for New York that has attracted people to come and look at it and think, and this, is a, this, is, this is an example of mm. actually it's not only small cities that can turn themselves around. Mm. The Monocle book, The Monocle Guide to Better Living, in could we could we as well call that the monocle guide to better living in cities? Yeah, again, it has a, a big kind of um, urbanist element, and uh, and quite deliberately we begin by looking at the best cities around the world to call home, or some of the best cities to call home. We look at uh, what you need to have a successful city, and again, I think we've chosen some surprising elements. We've talked about the notion of you know serendipity, for example. And we've tried to put spotlight on the kind of people you need in a team to run a city. And that's unusual for a book that you know, is the guide to better living. But it starts on the macro and runs through to the micro of the book. So it starts on the city scale. And the ambition for that book is to be inspirational, that people do think, actually, I should be helping run my neighborhood. I should be getting involved in, in, in the civic life of my city. The word inspirational is a good one to use because that's – the feeling I have from the magazine itself, you know, it, it's it's one of those things, though, that friends who I try to get on board to read Monocle, who are kind of resistant, they'll, they won't say, they'll, they'll accuse it of being aspirational, and I'll say, why is it bad to aspire? Like, was, you've, you've heard this charge before, I would imagine. What's, what do people mean when they say that negatively? Um, well, they probably don't say it to me, but... Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but you've heard of you know, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, you get some odd comments. You know, people say, okay, why do you run advertising in the magazine? Mm -hmm. uh, why do you have advertising from luxury good brands in the, ma in the magazine? Uh, because it pays for the magazine. Oh, you know, in fact, you, you know, you're buying it as a reader. That money is not enough to sustain the magazine. Mm -hmm. And at the core, what we're doing is, yeah, we, we want to tell you all these things. And I've said, we believe that people should get on planes to go and do stories and not do them over the phone. It's an expensive operation doing good journalism, and we believe that good journalism is valuable. So you know, in an issue, we'll have had 100 people out on the road, going places, meeting people, photographing them. And that is an expensive business. So, yeah, we, we work with brands who advertise in the magazine, and their advertising dollar or their advertising euro allows us to do, I think, robust journalism and fresh journalism that you won't see elsewhere. You can compare us to lots of the other kind of news titles, which I won't name, but pick, pick them up and they're about as uh, thick as a tissue. Mm. They have no original photography in them. Most of the pieces are thought pieces written from a desk in New York, mm. and they wonder why nobody buys them. Now, we are in a very fortunate position that percentage by percentage, we go up each year. We don't give away the magazine for free. You'll never see a free copy dumped on a train or on a plane. Right. If it's there, it's because somebody's bought it. And we're a small, robust business. I mean, we're not owned by a big media player. We started off with nine people and we've fought tooth and nail to make this a thriving business. And if people find it difficult that there are luxury brands in the magazine or there is a whiff of aspiration about it, I don't mind because I open that door and I see... You know, a team of young journalists who actually were training, employing, giving the time of their life, actually. Mm -hmm. And I meet people in other media titles and in other newspapers who are not doing journalism. They're kind of, they're navigating the downward spiral of their titles. <laughs> and, I'm, and I don't feel bad about what we put out. I think we put out an amazing product 
And if people don't like it, you're right, they don't have to purchase them. Why is London the place to do this? I think, as you said, multicultural. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of reasonably easy to get to other places from here. It could, yeah, could it sit in New York? Maybe I think it would become a US title if it did that, and we would have to play more of the American media game. I think you can be, you know, we we are just putting out the the next sales figure for the magazine. We'll sell we sell just over seventy five thousand copies, and that's not bad for a European magazine. And we we have big aspirations to grow, but we'd be uh, we'd be smaller fry probably in the American media market. Where else could we be? We could sit potentially in Europe, but I don't think we would have the cosmopolitanism or the entrepreneurialism that you find here in London. Mm -hmm. Could we sit in Asia again? Maybe. But again, we're looking at lots of things in Europe as as the kind of model for how we think should, should things should be done. And I think this is I think this in the end is probably despite some trials you know, getting around occasionally, and we're just about to have a subway strike for three days. Yes, the day I have to yeah. go to the airport. Okay, <laughs> those things are sent to test you. But in the end, as I said, you know, a city that surprises you, people from around the world, it, it makes it a good place to call home. Finally, what do you? What do you still, what questions does London still put in your head? What do you still get curious about in London? What, what does it still make you ask after all the time you've spent here? Um, I think the thing that surprises me most about London is that it is an organism. I'm, 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 I'm amazed how it pulls and flows in different directions. You know, the, when I first came to the city, the the threshold of where friends I knew lived stopped n not far of like the first postcode beginning with a, an East number. Mm. Now, most people in this bu business seem to live way beyond that. The whole Eastern area of the city has revitalized in a really short time, in 20 years. It, it went from Clark... Exactly like Los Angeles yeah. has done. It went, it went from Clarkenwell to yeah. Hoxton. Those, those neighborhoods are far from being borderline now uh, entrenched, you know, with kind of nice, wealthy loft livers, and you know, then suddenly it moves out to Hackney and beyond. Right. So it's interesting how the city pulls and tugs in different directions. A massive amount of development going on in the east around the Olympic Village, uh, around Greenwich Peninsula, that will reshape the city again and again. And I think I just want to still know London better. better you know, London is also like a, a person, and it has a... a a history that you know you learn more about as you live here, and uh, I hope that continues. What maybe what still remains concealed to you? Do you want to find out next about this city? Um, I want <laughs> a complicated question. What remains re not revealed? What do you suspect you still have yet to know about London? What kind of thing is will open up to you? Only with more time, only with more investigation, only with more inhabiting of this place. Uh, the only thing I think that makes you makes you curious is whether you know London, and I hope it does, and I'm, and I'm sure it will. But how London remains um, your partner, as it were, as the years go on. You, know, I'm no longer twenty or thirty, and I want to kind of stay in this city. So it's interesting how. I think cities are changing. I think cities are becoming places where actually it's good to be old in a city. You, you have access to health, health care. You have you know, access to entertainment and museums and a social life. But I want to see whether London grows old with me. Good prospects? I think so. <laughs> I've been sitting here in London, specifically Marlebone, with Andrew Tuck. He is the editor, founding editor, of Monocle magazine. He's also the editor of the Monocle Guide to Better Living and the host of The Urbanist from Monocle 24. Andrew, thanks so much. Thank you very much. This has been Notebook on Cities and Culture. I've been Colin Marshall. And you can keep up with the cultural creators, internationalists, and observers of the urban scene on the show at colinmarshall.org. Thanks. Special thanks to everyone who backed Season 4 on Kickstarter, including Joel Neville Anderson, Daniel Levin Becker, Paige Calvert, Commander Manvark, Jonathan Crow, John Cunningham, David Dawes, James DeVito, Tim Dobbs, Paul Doyle, Jake Elliott, Kevin Emmett, Lawrence English, Jonathan Filbert, Andrew Philippone Jr., Michael Fransky, John French, Themistoclus Eucrucius, Will Graham, Umberto Grant, Samuel Hansen, David Hayes, Jeff Hilnbrand, Mark Hines, Andrew Johnstone, Tadeusz Andrzej Kadlubowski, Peter Kavanaugh, 
Ted Kane, Andy Cooney, Evan Landman, Alfred Lee, James Maloney, Sean McDonald, Alberto Bruzos Moro, Jason Miller, Rob Montz, Daniel Murphy, Richard Nash, Aidan Nullman, Patrick O'Flaherty, Danny Olson, Michael O'Regan, Ian Plosker, Christopher Porter, MJ Pritchett, Piers Rippey, Rob Schultz, Todd Shimoda, Cam Smith, Deborah Smith, Adam Sutherland, Maureen Kincaid Speller, Anna Traher, Thomas Interberger, Matt Warren, Nick Weigelt, Dion Wolf, Cynthia Yang, and Wayne Wright.